we will move on for the other um, common fund project that we want to update you about, and that's the Genotype Tissue Expression Project, otherwise known as GTEx. And Jeff Struing um, is the lead for that uh, uh, at NHGRI. So I'll turn it over to Jeff. Great, thank you. Um, I'll be telling you a bit about the Genotype Tissue Expression Project, so-called GTEx. Um, this is a common fund project led by NHGRI and NIMH. Eric and Tom are our co-chairs. These are some of the lead institutes and lead program people. NCI is also a major contributor to this at the sample sort of collection and front end of things. but. We fortunately got very active participation from many ICs. It's been a really fun project. Um, the overall goal of GTEx is to establish a resource database and associated tissue bank in which we can study the relationship between genetic variation and gene expression initially in largely reference or non-diseased human tissues. The, the sort of grander goal is to collect up to approximately 1,000 post-mortem donors in which we collect multiple tissues from each and measure gene expression, the donors will be will be genotyped. It's funded as a two-year pilot project, really just to see whether this idea is, is feasible at all. Sort of can we get out there and collect these tissues and get good quality uh, samples from them? So in this two-year feasibility project, the specific aims are to enroll 160 post-mortem donors that will be unselected for disease status. They'll have a, a, a smattering of, of common chronic disease and then we need to show we can obtain high quality RNA from these multiple tissues. We aim to collect really about as many as we possibly can, as many as, as is feasible, 30 or more per postmortem donor. We'll be getting a kind of parallel series of surgery donors where we'll have a handful, sort of four to five tissues that are routinely discarded after surgery as a, as a sort of zero postmortem interval kind of comparison group. And the pilot will allow us to calculate at least cis expression quantitative trait loci. This is the, the sort of overall kind of data flow with the autopsy donors on the left and surgery donors on the right. So our goal again is 160. It's relatively broad eligibility criteria. Donors can be aged 21 to 70 at the time of death, um, largely unselected for disease status. They, they can't have disseminated cancer and, and a few infectious HIV related things, but largely um, will take most individuals. A blood sample will be drawn from each and we'll do the Illumina 5 million SNP chip on those and also attempt to establish a lymphoblastoid cell line. We'll be getting a skin sample that will undergo gene expression analysis, but we'll also attempt to establish fibroblastoid cell lines from them and then collect the many other additional peripheral tissues. When we have permission for the brain, it will be sent in whole overnight ice um, to an NIH supported brain bank. We'll get a small bit of cerebellum and cortex in the autopsy suite. The rest of the brain is, is then sent on for more specific dissection. Um, one, of the, one of the specimens will, will go for immediate histopathologic review. And this is a very important part of the whole project in that we'll have a, an expert pathology review, an H&E slide available for every single specimen that undergoes um, gene expression analysis. All this is done at biospecimen source sites um, of the multiple aliquots that at the current moment are being fixed in packed gene tissue preservative. Um, one aliquot goes immediately to our laboratory data analysis and coordinating center where they will extract the RNA and do all the laboratory analyses. Um, if the RNA is of high enough quality, we'll do mostly RNA-seq based gene expression analysis, not incredibly deep, but we don't have unlimited funds. In fact, we don't have enough funds to do all of the potentially sort of over 8,000 peripheral tissue samples that we hope to collect. Um, we have a, a sort of wet biorepository which will coordinate the storage and, and histopathologic review. These, this is a very full slide, but th these are sort of all the funded sort of groups. Again, all the tissue collection apparatus is coordinated and, and organized through NCI and SAIC Frederick through the Cancer Human Biobank, through Carolyn Compton's Office of Biospecimen and Biorepository Research. We've made three awards for biospecimen source sites. One is NDRI out of Philadelphia 
most all the post-mortem donors are coming through the, the, the National Organ Procurement Organization. These are, are the individuals who, who organize and, and identify people who can donate organs. So NDRI is working with both the Philadelphia and Virginia Beach OPOs. Um, all of our surgery donors, we have just one site, is NDRI. They will come from Drexel University there in Philly or Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And we're funding a, an LC sub-study through NDRI as well to Laura Simonoff at Virginia Commonwealth University. Roswell Park Cancer Institute is the second biospecimen source site. They're working with their local OPO, the Upstate New York Transplant Service. And our third one is Science Care in Phoenix, Arizona. They're a whole body donation program that deals mostly in training, education, and research. They don't do any uh, transplantation of tissues or organs, but they fall under many of the same sort of FDA and other kind of rules and regulations about, about screening donors. We have a, a, a wet biorepository at Van Andel Research Institute, and SAIC Frederick is kind of providing the, the kind of data coordination of, of the sample collection part of it. University of Miami is our is the, is the uh, has a supplement to to do the, the, the receive the brains. They'll dissect out approximately 11 uh, subregions that then go on to the Broad Institute, who is our laboratory data analysis and coordinating center, where really sort of all the molecular essentially all the molecular work. Um, the gene expression analysis and the, the kind of the basic CIS-QTL analyses will be coordinated. We've made five R01 awards for statistical methods development for this relatively unique data of having multi gene expression on multiple tissues from the same donor. Um, the NCBI will provide both a, a sort of a database of the EQTL results from GTEx and other EQTL human studies, and that will be where the, the controlled access data is, is made available as well. A pretty complicated um, structure. All of this is done through contracts. These are these are grants here. Um, as I mentioned, we have a, a relatively small LC sub study. We're we're thrilled to have Laura Simonoff leading that. Um, their goal really is to sort of understand the the factors that that affect consent to tissue donation for GTEx, so that we can make what we hope will be a scale up, um, an even better situation, and and just improving the informed consent process in this in this post-mortem setting all around. We've got a website on, on genome.gov that's more uh, oriented to, to the public. Um, Kathy Eng, the program analyst here at NHGRI, has been really helpful in getting that set up and getting that content in there. As I mentioned, one sort of important and relatively unique part of this is that every specimen in this that will undergo molecular analysis will also have an expert uh, pathology review. This is just a picture of some skeletal muscle from one of the early cases. Um, we did some of the early cases where we collect every, everything in four preservatives, including formalin, which is the typical preservative for, for clinical pathology labs in this Paxgene tissue. The pathologists basically love this Paxgene tissue, um, and it really gives h and E's images that are, are as good or better than, than, than the formalin. And in fact, for these early cases at least, we're going only with this fixative because it allows us to simplify the collection quite a bit. This is this is a very complicated collection in an autopsy suite where you have to get many, many hundreds of label, labeled vials with you know, exactly the right tissue and exactly the right amount and in the preservatives and lots of things recorded. Um, this is Carolyn's group of pathologists who are reviewing all of the slides. We made awards uh, the end of last summer. Uh, end of August was our biospecimen source site awards. It took us roughly six, six or seven months to kind of get all the protocols in place. Um, and, and really sort of begin to get our feet wet. Um, it, from December through early in this year, we did what we, what we called alpha experimental protocols, again, where we collected four aliquots into each of four different preservatives, the Paxgene tissue RNA later, SNAP frozen, and formalin. Then we moved to the, to the beta sort of protocol phase where they're relatively stable. We're still tweaking um, things a bit, but everything is now going into the, uh, into the Paxgene fixative. We had our last, we had our, our, our first in-person meeting with our external scientific panel in the first week in June. And we had been in the field for five or six weeks then, and I think we had sort of three, three donors by then. And there was a bit of concern then. Um, fortunately, our enrollment has gone up dramatically since then. It's really a credit to the biospecimen source site. These are incredibly professional groups that are accustomed to dealing with families at this time of, of, of crisis in approaching them for consent for tissue donation and organ donation and do some research protocols. This one's more elaborate and more extensive than what is typical 
but we've since sort of sort of bent this curve. This is just sort of a blow up of, of these first few months. But um, later in June, then we had we had five donors. We had nine in July, and we've had 15 in August. So we've sort of bent that curve. And really, I think many of us have, have breathed a big sigh of relief that the sort of donor enrollment has really sort of um, kind of taken off. I mentioned the, the sort of the donor characteristics of 21 to 70 and such. They had to have a BMI less than 35. We let a, a pretty broad range. The, the, the autopsy had to occur, start within uh, 12 hour, within 24 hours of death. The vast majority of these have been much much earlier than that, um, and in fact, many of them are, are less than 12 hours or, or six hours or less. This shows some um, early, and, and all this is really preliminary data. This shows some of the molecular sort of quality data. On the y-axis here is the RIN number, the RNA integrity number. This is a, a sort of surrogate for, for, for quality. This goes from 0 to 10. The higher number, the better. Um, generally, things in the 5, 6, or certainly 7 and above range are going to generally give you very good gene expression results. These are the first, I think, 26 donors that met the eligibility criteria. So each of these points represents an individual organ and the RIN value for that organ. Um, the symbols in sort of the bluish green uh, there are individuals who are solid organ donors. So these are individuals that generally would have been on life support on a ventilator sort of and, be, and declared brain dead or, or a cardiac death. They're, they then provide an, org, uh, an organ, a kidney or, or something for, for clinical transplantation once that is completely finished. So all the clinical tissue and organ donation proceeds before anything related to GTEx happens. They tend to be lower postmortem intervals, but basically you're seeing that, you know, with the exception of a few donors where many of the tissues are, are, are not very high quality, that we've really got the majority of donors with median RINs well above six, which is our semi-arbitrary sort of cutoff. I think that the molecular quality is looking quite promising early on. This is essentially the same data, just sliced in a slightly different way. Again, the RIN number on the y-axis here. Now I'm showing the, the various tissues that we're collecting. You can see it's a very broad range of, of organs, pretty much all of the internal organs and such. So each dot here now re represents one individual for which tibial nerve was, was measured, and, and this is the RIN value. Everything with a BB at the end of it are the tissues that are um, processed at our brain bank and then sent on to the, to the LDAC. Almost all of them are yielding very high quality RNA. Some of the organs that we'd certainly like to study are sort of have, have had, tend, some, had some of the lower RIN values, particularly liver. That's the one where there's, there's almost as much existing human data on sort of single tissue um, existing in the literature and, and publicly available. Those haven't been generally all that great. But I think we're going to have many, many organs representing a range of tissues and histology and things that are going to give us really quite good um, values. The data analysis is th the initial processing and everything is, is being done at the Broad, um, led by Gaddy Getz, but David DeLuca has been very instrumental in, in coming up with a sort of customized fire hose um, analysis pipeline for the RNA-seq and integrating all this um, to get to the point to be able to do an NEQTL calculation. You can see our statistical methods, R01 investigators, is, a, is an, an incredibly strong group. They attended, many of them attended our last meeting as well. So we've been having nearly monthly teleconference calls where this group gets together and talks about which reference sequence we're mapping the RNA-seq to, and just so that everybody's on the same page about how the data is being generated. Um, and, and they're then poised to, to make best use of, of, of this unique data. We've really only got quite preliminary gene expression data. Most of these samples have come in in July and August. And it takes a couple of months to get completely through the RNA-seq pipeline. We took some of the samples from those early donors where we compared the various preservatives, because there's not that much known about RNA-seq with RNA later or Pax gene tissue. But using AFI expression arrays, the, the correlation was, was really quite good between the same organs um, done with different cDNA library preps and different preservative methods. And the RNA-seq is not completely through the analysis, but it, it's looking very good as well. The, the sort of initial quality metrics for the RNA-seq look, look very good for Pax gene tissue. The Broad has done a fair bit of number of experiments with non-GTEx tissue looking at different cDNA library preps because we're getting sort of between 100 to 
one gram aliquots. Um, a relatively small amount of that goes into the initial RNA extraction. We'd like to we'd like to do this on much smaller input amounts. In this DSN light, this du duplex specific nucleus light cDNA prep looks to be really quite promising over a range of, of RIN values, of RNA quality values, and with pretty small input amounts. We're, I think, going to start with about a half a microgram, 500 nanograms, but it looks pretty good even down to the sort of 100 to 10 nanogram kind of input amounts. We, we do have a fair number of tissues now of, of real GTEx tissues that over a range of RIN values to still kind of put all this through its paces to, to get through the RNA-seq pipeline, and that's just not quite available yet. But I think sort of in general, the, the donor enrollment now has kind of taken off. We're, we're, we're quite pleased with that. We may be able to get more restrictive to get even shorter post-mortem intervals to, to take those donors that give us even the best quality. Those solid organ donors are giving sort of the best quality. Unfortunately, those are, well, those are donors that have been on a ventilator and the brain is generally not appropriate for analysis in those individuals. So that it's a bit of a trade-off. The other organs we can get very quickly, but we generally aren't collecting the brains, the whole brains on those individuals. Um, the, all this data being a, a common fund community resource will be essential, will be made available to the scientific community. The sort of final policies and everything are, are still being worked out, but we imagine quarterly DB gap releases. Um, the individually identifiable data will be behind controlled access, even though in the post-mortem setting, this legally wouldn't be classified as human subjects research. Every, every either donor, if it's a sort of pre-decedent sort of consent, or their next of kin provide consent or authorization for this, they know about the study that we're going to be doing genetic research and, and making it available to the scientific community. So it'll be in a DBGAP like controlled access process. We'll make as much of it open access as we can. A lot of the results, some of the sort of non variant containing gene expression values, we, we expect to be able to make sort of freely publicly available. Um, and that will be through this website, which is, which is up now, and you can sort of browse some of the existing EQTL data sets. There isn't any GTEx data there yet. Um, we have a, a very uh, strong external scientific panel. Ross is on this panel. He's our, he's our council representative. Um, and many of them, or a number of them, I think actually more than half, were able to attend the, the last meeting. And these are the principal investigators of the various funded sites. Um, these, are, these are incredibly professional teams at the biospecimen source sites. I'm thrilled to be working with them. Harold Magazine is, a, is the PI at Science Care. John Lonsdale leads a big team at NDRI. Um, Barbara Foster at Roswell Park. Greg Korzenewski leads the SAIC Frederick team that's coordinating all of this. Kristen Ardley and Wendy Winkler are the PIs from the Broad. Scott Jewell from Van Andel Research Institute and uh, Deborah, Deborah Mash. Uh, sorry, I mis mistyped her last name there. It should be capital M, obviously, um, is the PI at the University of Miami Brain Bank. And I'll end there and take questions. So this is a really exciting initiative. I'm just, uh, are you collecting, and maybe I missed it, are you collecting as well paired uh, samples where possible while the um, individual is still alive related to the issue of uh, not so much the degradation of RNA and all this, but, but the uh, presumably very aberrant expression patterns of all sorts of proteins or genes and proteins post-mortem? Um, uh, effectively not. So we're, we're, um, we're, we're collecting no pre-decedent tissues on the post-mortem donors. Um, the, 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 I guess the donors that would be solid organ donors, these are individuals that generally are in intensive care units on life support, you know, and it's usually a, a several day process of, of going through the, the steps to establish that there's no, that, that, it, that there's brain death and such. So those would be donors, I guess, where conceivably we could, we, we honestly didn't go down that path just thinking that it was already complicated enough sort of getting permission to collect all these um, post-mortem. The surgery tissues are, are, are is a kind of a, a meant to be something of a surrogate of, of tissues that will will be subject to surgical and anesthetic um, changes that might occur. But these so these will be you know tissues that 
have no post-mortem interval, certainly. Um, and so they, these, this will be skin and fat and muscle and artery and nerve that, that are, you know, sort of fixed within within minutes to, to an hour or less after. So they're not from the same same people, obviously. Sorry, I've gone on too long with that. Carlos? So will tissue resources? So will tissue resources also be made available for, say, creation of cell lines? I mean, one of the big questions will be how different is expression there from EBV transform cell lines, which is where we know what we think we know about EQTLs. That's right. We 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 hope to be able to. I mean, we're we're attempting to establish those. So we're okay. Um, um, so the blood sample will be the source for the for the genotyping. We're putting some of it in Pax gene to get RNA expression, and we're going to attempt to establish um, EBV lymphoblastoid okay. cell lines exactly for that reason. Um, and we're also getting a skin sample that's sent on in media. So these are sent, you know, it's like immediately. So they're, I mean. This is like it's a it's a it's a symphony to 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 package and send all of these things. They go to many different places, all in a different temperatures, different. It's a it's an undertaking. The skin goes directly as well for fibroblasts and potential iPS yeah, cell establishment. That was the next question. Those so, um, have been really successful so far. So I think of the of the first 13 donors. 12 of the 13, have, we, we've established a fibroblast cell line. One of them became contaminated and didn't transform. Of that same set of donors, I think only three or four of the EBV lines have transformed. Um, you know, the blood that's obtained post-mortem, now many of these were the what I refer to as tissue donors. So these are these are people who have passed away, are sort of, you know, in a hospital, in, in a morgue maybe, or on their way to a morgue, and and people are approached, the families are approached to donate skin or, um, or uh, cornea or things like that. So the blood is, is obtained um, with, from the subclavian or intracardiac. It's not incredibly cellular, um, and it's sometimes several hours old. So um, we're hoping to get as many of them um, transformed as possible, but it, at least early on, it's looking like that won't be quite as successful. And it'll be a resource that folks can, you know, somebody could propose, let's that's, genome sequence everybody, let's make iPS cells in three different that, ways. That's that right. That's right. I mean, um, our, our, our external scientific panel told us, that, you know, sort of warned us that it would be probably take us at least as long to figure out how to get the samples back out of the repository than it's taken us to get them in. Which, so I, you know, I wouldn't, Next year, when I give an update, I'll be surprised if we have the pl processes completely in place to make them available. But that's that's absolutely the the, the intention or hope. Yes. Um, I, I was curious at the high number that were tissue donors, and just wondered about the uh, both pre and post mortem changes to the brain, and that the majority of those, um, you know, with brain death have incredible brain swelling, no, you know, no perfusion, et cetera. Are those Samples usable? Right. So, um, uh, generally, no. So the, the the people that are solid organ donors, the people who have been on a ventilator for usually more than a day um, before the the cross clamping and and the removal of the organs for transplantation, those brains we, we essentially are, are not sending on. We're, we are taking a um, if we have permission, we're taking a portion of of cortex and cerebellum. But um, though you're right, I mean those. The, the brains are, are really not. Yes. Jeff, has there been any consideration of getting uh, other members of the family, at least blood from other members of the families? It's been raised a time or two. We haven't um, we haven't gone down that that path. Um, certainly, something we we could consider. I mean, it, it's always useful from a genetics point of view, at least, to have other family members. And, um, you know, obviously talking to these families is a very difficult and delicate issue, but if the family is together at that time and what you need is a blood sample, I don't think it would be that much uh, much more difficult to obtain. Yeah, that would be certainly something to, to consider. I mean, the one of the sort of blessings of it being a, a, a two-year pilot is that we're we're using it as that we're gonna, we're, we've uh, we've learned a lot obviously just getting to this point and so um, you know we'll have the opportunity to 
to, to make alterations as we consider scale up and, and hopefully adding many other kinds of molecular analyses to the, to the existing samples and, and using the tissues for, for further Is there any restriction on the ethnic makeup uh, or what is the current ethnic makeup of the samples that are coming in or how's that being dealt with? Um, I, I don't have on the tip of my tongue the, the, the geographic sort of ancestral origin of, of the donors. We, 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 th th there are no restrictions about um, racial or ethnic um, makeup of, of the donors. In fact, we, we, we chose the 160 in part um, assuming that we would t sort of take essentially all comers and that we would have um, enough of, of any one um, racial ethnic group to, to have enough polymorphic individuals. So it, it's, a, it's a mixture. I know there are, um, I think, at least a handful of African Americans in the first uh, 30 or so donors, um, but it's, it's essentially all comers. Um, great. 